Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Narrows Podcast. I'm your host James and I'm joined as always by my good friend Timila. Hi everyone. Our guest today is a judge who's also in recovery from addiction, which I bet is very rare. Mary Beth O'Connor, a very Irish name, but you're American. <laughs> I'm American, I'm American, but I do have the Irish colouring, so... <laughs> you do actually. Can you tell us about your Irish ancestry or the connection? Yeah, my my uh, ancestors on the O'Connor side came over before the Civil War during one of the potato famines, and uh, until my grandfather, they were everyone was 100% Irish. But then we became Americanized, and now I'm a mutt. But I am still 25% Irish, and I carry the coloring and the name. <laughs> have you been over here? No, but I do. We do have plans to come over in 2024, 2025. At least you can prove your Irish any of that name O'Connell. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, and, and Mary, not... in America, Mary Beth is a is a Catholic name, especially in the East Coast. I grew up in New Jersey, so my whole name is pretty darn Irish American. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You have an absolutely amazing story as well, um, and we're just going to get into it a little bit. But we'll start off basically just give us a little bit of context in relation to what it was like for you growing up. Where you where where you lived and um, and who was in the household growing up, and just give us a little bit of a, an understanding of how it was for you. So, whenever you're ready, just jump in there and. Um Totally. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I say the short version is child abuse led to child addiction, right? I mean, it's a, a too, all too common story. Um, my mother wasn't really connected to me. In fact, I was left at the nunnery for the first six months of my life because she wasn't allowed to bring me home because she wasn't married. And later one time I lived for three years with a great grandmother. And, and my mom could be violent, but, uh, but it really got a lot worse when she married my stepfather when I was nine. And he was really violent with her and he was physically and sexually violent with me and it was just that kind of household where you never knew what was going to happen and you're always on eggshells always under stress um, I, I what I tell the example of when I um, was young and I realized how threatening he was how you know violent he could be I taught my little sister that when we put the dishes away from the dishwasher that we had to do it one dish at a time so it didn't clack like that was the level of stress that we were adapting to so picking up drugs early at least seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I, yeah. I can imagine how um, a child's nervous system must be when they're dealing with something like that in the family household, the fear of, of something that could kick off at any moment within the household. How, how did you actually deal with that fear? You know, I mean, at first I thought, okay, well, he just has new rules. Let me try to adjust, you know, like, like he, we weren't allowed to go barefoot in the house. Well, I'd always gone barefoot. Okay, I, I can I can adjust, you know, but over time I realized that it really wasn't related to what I did, that my actions were not the primary driver. I could do the same thing 10 times and it was fine. And the 11th time it was like I did the worst thing in the world and I would get a beating. And so it created a lot of anxiety. I also felt as the oldest, oldest, you know, protective towards my sister. Um, and also even watching my mother get beaten, uh, watching someone in your family get assaulted is a trauma in and of itself. Uh, the police would come once in a while, but this was the 70s and they would just tell them to cool off or go away for a while. But it was just a, a constant strain. I mean, nothing might happen for two or three weeks. It's just that it was unpredictable and out of my control. You know, back here, uh, in like Ireland is a Catholic country, so uh, I'm back in the in your era, let's say in the 70s, where the Catholic Church would have a real strong hold on the community, and the country, and policy, and morality, and all that stuff. So when you say the shame for your mother giving birth to a child out of wedlock, like we understand that here. In Ireland, we had places like the Magdalene laundries and different mm -hmm. places where women would have to go and work and get really very badly treated. Was it like that in America too? And maybe can you talk to us about maybe the stress your, must, your mother must have been under to leave her child at the nunnery? 
Yeah, so I don't think we had an equivalent to the Magdalene houses, which I know, but there was a special system. So my mother got pregnant with me in 1961 when she was 18. And the, the my biological father, there was like a family meeting with my grandparents, my mother, him and his parents. And basically they said they, they were going to let this derail his life. And so he didn't marry her. They just walked completely walked away. And uh, my mother, there was a special system the Catholic Church had set up where they had an unwed, I, w I grew up in Central Jersey, she was in Central Jersey, but they had an unwed mother's home in Philadelphia, which is about 15 miles away. And they would route her mail through the Boston diocese. So she said she was in Boston I, doing something, I'm not sure what. And the church would send her friend's letter, uh, my mother's letters to her friends through the diocese. And they, she, the friends got a, di uh, a Boston address and then the diocese would forward the letters to my mother in this unwed mother's home in Philadelphia. The other thing that was interesting was that she wasn't even allowed to go into the main home for the, uh, the first month or two because another woman from her area was already there. And so to protect the privacy, she was in this sort of secondary house until that other woman left. And so then she went there and they had medical, you know, she had had me. I was born in Philadelphia, um, but my grandparents wouldn't let her bring me home. They, they weren't going to allow, uh, you know, an illegitimate child in the house. And so that's how I ended up at the nuns. I lived with a nunnery a few miles away for about the first six months. Um, so there was definitely a, a concern about protecting, you know, this information and keeping it all secret. Yeah. So your mother, your mother was obviously traumatized at this stage. You know, she'd gone through so much. Was there addiction within the household as well as you, as you were growing up? So there was gambling addiction. My my grandfather had a gambling problem. In fact, one time he forged a, a, my grandmother's signature on a second mortgage and they almost lost the house. And my mother had a gambling problem and she had a shopping problem. But the um, the substances was really started with my sister and I and you know, most likely because of the level of violence that we experienced. I mean, that that trauma in America, we have something called the adverse childhood experiences score. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar. I mean, my yeah. age score is seven, which is, you yeah. know, very high. And so my odds of picking up substances was probably five or six times than that, you know, the average because of my history. I yeah. can completely relate to a lot of your story myself, you know, um, growing up in, in, in a home like that. And I remember growing up just consistently being f just full of fear, not just because of what was probably going on inside the family household, but also when you go up in the streets, I had issues out in the streets because of the way I looked because of the clothes that I wore, because of the poverty that was in, in our household. And other kids would have looked down on something. They would look down upon me as in somebody, you know the way it is, kids and bullying and stuff like that. It's, it, they don't mean it, but it really hurt. Was things like that happening to you as well as a young child out in the street? And stuff? I mean, I will say that for me, school was actually my one special place. You know, I got a lot of positive attention at school. I always did really well. Uh, I, and for example, the, the library in my grade school, it, the books in the library were divided by grade. You know, these were the first grader books and the second grader books and the third grader books. And my first grade teacher took me to the librarian and told her I could read any book in the library. Like there was no limit for me. And so I, it was just that being noticed, like somebody saw me, somebody valued sort of like a natural inherent attribute I had. On the other hand, I did have problems outside the household as far as other assaults. You know, I had mm -hmm. other, I, I had actually two multi-assailant rapes, one at 17 and one at 19, and other, you know, sexual assaults, or I moved to with a violent boyfriend in college. So I had outside the home traumas added to it, but, um, but it was really more when I was a teenager and into the college years. Yeah, because like the, the, the childhood traumas probably lead you down the addiction route, but addiction in and of itself is a traumatic experience, you know, to be on the streets, to having to secure illicit drugs, deal with some very dangerous people, and then being under the influence and not being able to have your wits about you and being vulnerable around predators and stuff like that. Like, I worked in homeless services and drug and alcohol services here in Cork City, and you'd see the women especially are especially more vulnerable when they're under the influence, you know, stuff like that. 
That's true. It's true. I, I mean, you're you're at a you're at risk, and it's also that I wasn't taught to sort of value my bodily integrity, right? I wasn't really given the message that I was allowed to make decisions about what happened to my body or or to control my body, and I, so I didn't really even know exactly how to say no. Uh, the first time I had sex outside the household, I was 13, and he was 18, and in my mind, this was like a sign of my attractiveness, right? My ability to get some somebody he was you know really good looking guy and popular but it, as an adult i look at it I'm like well that was actually a crime <laughs> you know but mm -hmm. i didn't see it that way i just I, I had been sexualized in the home and i viewed and my mother really was focused on physical attractiveness you know really wanted me to be pretty and bought nice clothes and was unhappy when i used to have these thick bottle glasses because i had very bad eyesight but when i was 13 i got contact lenses and she was so relieved that now i would be able to get a boyfriend and um, so there was this real emphasis on the physical, but also me not knowing how to sort of set boundaries around myself. I just didn't know how to do it. Yeah, you made a good point, yeah. Derek. I seen something on the internet the other day. It was Howard Stern Radio, which was a big thing in America, mm -hmm. and Quentin Tarantino was on it, the famous movie director. And they were talking about uh, predators in Hollywood. And... Quentin Tarantino was basically making excuses for this person that was after being caught with a 13 year old girl saying that it was it was consensual she was going to the parties and Howard Storm was like she's 13 she's a kid like it doesn't matter if she consented to it she can't be in a position of consent when she's only a child you know and a, ch a 13 year old is a very immature person and they can't give consent at that age. Yeah. That's right. And, and I didn't understand that. I mean, the, the modern concept of consent, I'm really so happy to see the conversation around that, not just around age, but that, you know, affirmative consent is a good idea, not just because someone doesn't say no, doesn't really mean they're saying yes, right? There's a, there's a difference between silence and yes. And for a lot of us with those sexual assault histories, I think it's, it's harder for us to assert ourselves. And if somebody would ask me a direct question, do you agree? I mean, first of all, I was 13, I might have said yes anyway, but that that's really not a decision that's appropriate for me. But even older, it might have been hard, but it would have been it's interesting to have that idea that there should really we should really be having that affirmative consent um, discussion because it's not pe women in particular don't always feel comfortable saying no. Um, and it's also even with the you know, the whole thing around sexual assault. When I, one of my sexual assaults, I was like kidnapped, taken off the street by, by three men in a van. And so when I see on TV where like everybody who gets kidnapped like that is screaming for help, you know, that's not always the right answer. There were three of them, you know, there was actually a gun on me. And also who was going to hear me most of the time? And so there's these sort of artificial requirements of what we should have to do in order to be able to say that we didn't agree that are um, softer. They're lessening now. People have a better appreciation of of the the breadth of what sh what's what's permissible and what's actually affirmative consent you know you know when you started using drugs and stuff and, and alcohol um how did you feel how did it make you feel and what age were you when 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 you started using Initially. So my first drug was alcohol, which was very common in my day. It was Boone's Hill, Hill, Hill Strawberry Wine, which is popular sort of sweet, sweet wine. And um, and and I was twelve, and my girlfriend brought it over on her bicycle, like in her little bicycle basket that she had stolen it from her older sister. <laughs> um, and what I noticed was that I felt better. You know, it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. We were laying on the floor giggling and having a good time, and and that caught my attention. You know, this is a positive experience this makes me feel good I want more yeah. and so I was pursuing alcohol from the beginning and then I just moved on to other things pretty fast you know uh, pot when you know now we'd say weed and pills I did a lot of acid my sophomore year of high school and when I was 16 I found my drug of choice which was methamphetamine and I was shooting up within six months and I was in full bore addiction in high school I mean it was a quick escalation for me and that's crystal meth yes crystal, crystal yeah. Crystal so what meth. kind of what kind of high do people get off crystal meth? 
I mean, methamphetamine releases more dopamine in your brain than any of the other drugs. It's, you know, it's a very intense hit. Um, and shooting it is an even more intense hit. And it's interesting. I've thought about this because, like you see now, I'm sober. I'm, I'm talkative. I'm sort of a little hyper, yeah. high energy. So you'd think that opiates would have attracted me. Let me mellow out. But that isn't what, that isn't what attracted me. I had done opiates. I had done downers. And they were fine, you know. But when I found meth, I, I became committed <laughs> I was committed to meth, like it was my drug, um, and it it was it was the intensity of the high. But what I also liked was the depth of the crash, because when I would let's say was up for three days and I went to sleep, I didn't have nightmares. I wasn't tossing and turning. It was like this black pit of sleep you know i didn't remember anything and i had always struggled to how to get my brain to shut off and how to not focus on you know hard things um i had struggled with sleep as a child and so i even liked the crash part of the high because it was a new sleep without without having to struggle getting to sleep or without having nightmares and how did you how did you fund how, how were you able to fund um your drug addiction back then you know, I was a young, pretty girl, and so I got a lot of drugs for free. And yeah. um, and I worked. I started working in high school. You know, I worked, and uh, and then when I went to college, I actually did a little better with the meth. I didn't use it as much, um, but I had that one of that bad multi-assailant rape in college and moved in with a violent boyfriend in january of my senior year of college i picked meth up heavily again and i used it until i was 32. um so it was a long haul which i would work for a while i say i worked my way down the corporate ladder right because yeah. every job i had a berkeley degree which is you know an excellent school and um good grades but i couldn't hold the job because i was using all the time so i was you know every job was like less money and less responsibility and i held it for less time but i did you know work half the time let's say on average uh, during those last 10 years um but you know that's pretty easy to get and it's not hyper expensive like cocaine or some of the other drugs you know you know the way and a lot of films when you see somebody using meth crystal meth you see them they're tweaking their eyes are massive and they look like they look like they're ready to actually die you know there's 10 and they look absolutely like mm. death is were you be able to manage the way you looked? Are we we able to kind of keep yourself a little bit um healthy and normal to look at at this stage as well? No, I, I mean I was having a, a lot of by the time I was thirty two, I was having a lot of physical problems. Uh, you know, meth is toxic, but also my skin was always broken out. I tended to pick at it. I you know my I, I just looked gray. You know, I looked gray and exhausted. And, and I will say, you know, my memoir, I titled it From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. First of all, because of that trauma of substance use connection we talked about, but also I chose to use that word junkie on purpose. I would never use that for somebody else, but I really yeah. wanted to make it clear that when I say that I was, a, you know, addicted, that I that I mean that, I, you know, I shot meth. I shot meth on a regular basis. And, and like you say on television, when they show people who are shooting meth, they're always looking like they're in some house with, you know, garbage strewn around them and they look like they're ready to die. Mm. And I really wanted to own that, you know, I was her, you know, that's where I was. I shot meth basically for 15 years. And yet in recovery, uh, you know, not only was I able to be a judge, which is, you know, I'm proud of that, but it was my job, you know, but mostly I have a happy and healthy and, you know, not chaotic life, which is really um, it, that it's possible even for people that are struggling at that depth, at that level. Yeah. How did, I, it, all, how, how did it all come to an end? So sorry, James, I leave you in there. How did it all yeah. come to an end for you, Mary? Like, <sighs> when did you know that like this this can't go on? Yeah, so I was 32, so I've been using for 20 years and basically using meth for 15, and um, and the last 10 have been just worse and worse and worse. And so I, I couldn't hold a job. I was having physical problems. I was exhausted beyond exhausted, you know, hopeless and in despair. And then my partner was ready to throw me out. And so as sort of a last resort, I said, you know, well, what if I go to rehab? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so when I was 32, I went into a, a longer term women's program. It was 90 days minimum, although I ended up staying for five months. Um, it turned out not to be the best fit, but that's that's when I finally went in when I was 32. I heard you mention in a, another interview that you did um, when you went into the treatment center that um, it worked in many ways, but you didn't really get the... Um, 
the spiritual side of the 12-step program that they were promoting inside there. Do you think that your, I suppose, objection to religion and spirituality, uh, maybe objection is not the right word, but you know what I mean, do you think that might have come from the strong traditional Catholic background and a kind of resentment and a, a kind of a rejection of that? I, you know, I, I don't think so as much. I mean, my mother had actually been divorced um, from my sister's father, my my first father, and so she was excommunicated at the time. Um, so we would go to church on Sunday. We'd go to my grandmother's house and sometimes go to church, but it wasn't a huge part of our life. I, I would definitely have said when I was young that I believed in God. But as I got older, I realized, well, first I realized I didn't believe in hell. And I thought, well, if you don't believe in hell, you can't really be Catholic. <laughs> um, and then I realized, you know, I don't actually believe in God. And that had all happened by the time I was in college. And so when I got sober at 32, that was sort of a resolved question for me. Um, and so in, in the 12 steps, you know, AA and all that, it, I didn't believe in a higher power. So for that reason, it wasn't going to work. But I also didn't agree with turning my will and my life over. I didn't agree I was powerless. And I didn't like to focus on defects. So there were multiple reasons why it wasn't the right fit. I mean, it's a good fit for a lot of people, but it wasn't the right fit for me and it's not for many. And so it's um, it's good that we have a lot of options today and people can find, it was a little harder for me to find the options in 1994 when I got sober. I, I, I say I had, I had to go to the library, like there was no Google, you know, <laughs> I had to get my car and go to the library and do the research. Um, but today there's a lot of options online, including life ring, secular recovery, I'm on the board for them and they have um, meetings in Ireland, but there's also all kinds of options online other than that. And so it wasn't a good fit. They told me this is the one and only way. And it wasn't true, luckily, because I wasn't going to be able to do it that way. So I had to sort of um, I had to trust my own judgment and not believe them when they told me that the only option was 12 steps, because if I would have believed them, I would have given up because it wasn't going to work. Um, but luckily, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's not right. And I, I tried to listen for the parts I thought I could use, you know, not just to reject the whole thing. And then when I got out of the rehab, I, I did the research at the library and I found other options and I sort of blended them into a program that worked for me, you know, and has worked for the last 29 years. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. It's a good point you made. And I think it's important that you said that while, while you were there, you, you looked for the pieces of it that would work for you. And, you know, because we can find fault in everything if we want to. And like when you're in the depths of addiction and there's an opportunity to go into residential rehab, you have to try and make it work as best as you can because it's life or death at that stage. And if you went in there and there and says, oh, all this religious stuff, or I don't want to have my will and life over to the guard and left the treatment centre, you probably would not be here today. So like you made a decision, yeah, there's, there, there are some things here that I find challenging, but I'm going to really make it work. And because there will be people watching this, and they'll be thinking, I'm not going to that treatment centre because of this, because of that, because of the other. But if you find, if 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 you go in with that mentality, you'll never find anything that works for you. Do you want? Mm. Well, what I will say is that it's it's um, it's n not true that there aren't any other options. If a treatment program says there is no other way, this is the one and only way, they're they're really they're lying to you <laughs> because mm. there are other ways. There are many, many, many people who have gotten sober other ways, and so that would always be a red flag for me if they wouldn't acknowledge that there's more than one pathway. On the other hand, if that's the only option on the table for you because that's what you can afford or that's in your local community, then I agree. What you have to do is go. Go in there, um, you know, be confident that there is a path forward for you. Look for the pieces that will help. Like, like I looked at that powerless step again, which I didn't agree I was powerless over my addiction, but I thought about it and I thought, I said, well, you know what I can agree? I can agree that I am powerless to moderate. <laughs> like, there is no moderating for me, you know? And I found the one day at a time idea helpful, you know, if I was having a bad craving day. So I agree if, if you're forced into a program that's not the right fit, just, you know, trust your judgment, look for the pieces that, that can help. And then when you get out, you'll be able to participate in whatever program you want, include even if it's online. So um, we have to we have to work with what's given us. On the other hand, I would recommend that any treatment provider that's listening to this would educate themselves about the options and really refrain from telling people there's only one way because it just isn't true. You, you, you mentioned about the powerless thing there. Um, I remember at the start of my own recovery, I, I needed people around me that were that had the same experience as me who were alcoholics and addicts and whatever. But for the first six months, twelve months, all I done was rant inside an AA meeting, just fucking hated everybody. Absolutely hated the world. But as I started to grow, right, through therapy, 
through meditation, through uh, education, through learning how childhood trauma had affected me and how I wasn't able to soothe myself when, when, when things went wrong for me or I wasn't able to process situations and emotions. When I was able to deal with these things on my own level and just accept things for what they were, my life changed. I had the power then and I still have the power now. I have the power to change whatever day I I, I want to have. Like if if I'm struggling and having a really bad day, right? I don't need to pick the phone up anymore. Okay, I don't need to go to an AA meeting anymore. All I need to do is sit down and feel and accept the way I'm feeling, and that's how I deal with my life today. You know, before if I was struggling, I would go on the phone. I'd be telling somebody how bad I was, or uh, this person done that, and that person done this, and I would be making the situation, just blowing the whole situation up in the air and making it a whole lot worse, and I'd feel worse, and I'm bringing up motions then from past traumatic things, and when I started to just, oh, it is, this is it, just feel my life change. Would something like that be similar to what was going on for you? Well, I, I will say that, like you, my trauma recovery, um, as well as just my sort of bad bad behaviors, like I had terrible interpersonal skills, you know, I mean, I had a lot to work on when I got sober, besides just being sober. And my trauma recovery was harder and took a lot longer than my substance recovery because it was older and it was more complicated, right? And so I too, and, and look, a lot of us, a very high percentage of us walk into recovery with trauma histories and or mental health challenges. I had PTSD and I didn't even know it. Um, I had, you know, severe anxiety, severe, and I thought I was just kind of high strung <laughs> so it's it's i i too took, did that multi-prong attack where i did i did individual therapy for the trauma with a, someone with that specialty and i did meds for a couple years and then i did a i did a group um a therapy group for women with trauma histories and oh my gosh that was like a whole nother level of recovery for me and so for a lot of us to really f become our best self to be you know to live a happy and chaotic free life we have to deal with the recovery from on both sides of the street from both our mental health or trauma and our substances to get to where you are that's that's often what it takes you know you, you know some treatment centers back here in ireland they won't they don't see the correlation between mental mm -hmm. health and addiction they won't take you into a treatment center if it's um if it's mental health or they won't take it, it vice versa is, is it something like that similar over in the states so when i got so yeah, and when I got sober in 94, what they told us was they wouldn't even evaluate us for mental health for 90 days until we got the drugs out of our system. But today in America, that is not what that's not the norm. The evidence, the evidence based approach is that everyone who goes in for substance abuse treatment should be evaluated for mental health. Um, and really, everyone who goes in for mental health treatment should be evaluated for substance use because there is such a close interplay. And that the data shows that if you attack both simultaneously, the odds of success are higher. I mean, I think about somebody I know who was struggling with their sobriety because they're bipolar. They were having trouble getting their bipolar uh, uh, you know, um, uh, diagnosis under control. They were having trouble getting the meds stable. You know, they were all, it was a, it was like a year and a half before in recovery before their meds for their bipolar bipolar was stabilized and only then was he able to put together really lengthy sobriety he was having like periods of sobriety during that year and a half but until his mental health got stabilized he wasn't able to really get long-term sobriety and it's it's a common interplay i mean he really he, i'm surprised that they wouldn't at least recognize that um that both it, that we're all better off if both are attacked at the same time Our, your odds of success are just going to be a lot higher yeah, yeah, and de dealing with dealing with an addiction like all a, all a drug addiction is, or alcohol, or any addiction really, it's just a symptom yeah. of the trauma, and that's how it plays out. And it plays out like we had. I don't know if you're familiar with Doctor Gabo Mate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we had Doctor Gabo Mate on the podcast with us, which was amazing to have him on because he's a you know, brilliant man. And he said that he had the issues with shopping and buying CDs and all this <laughs> stuff that stuff that he didn't need. And it was a compulsion. He, I remember he was telling us that he, he, he left, uh, he was delivering a baby, right? 
and he left the middle of it to go and buy a new, you know, <laughs> Beethoven symphony thing. I was fucking mad. He said he'd about a hundred of my home. He didn't even open the cases, and, but it was just this compulsion. But he, he said it all stems back from his own stuff coming from World War Two, Hungary, and all that. You know, so the addiction is only a symptom of an underlying problem. Um, when you come out of the treatment centre, that's them when you're met with the behaviours, like what you have, the maladaptive behaviours that probably helped you to survive the madness, but they won't help you moving forward. You need a new way of communicating with people. And we always speak about this, like you, your interpersonal skills weren't great. Like we had language, it was nearly all slang. Like we knew how to communicate with each other on the street. But in an office environment or you know, filling out forms and applications or trying to you know, advocate for yourself with the social welfare or housing. It's like, how do you speak to these people? How do you, what language do you have to use? You know, it's a different way. And that can bring up a lot of anxiety and fear. And the enormity of the task can get overwhelming. And, you know, it's a breeding ground for relapse in those early days, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say is, um, for me, in early recovery, I was making mostly the right, mostly, I mean, none of us are perfect, but mostly the right choices, you know, moving forward in my life. But I wasn't actually enjoying my success the way I deserved because the anxiety was so overwhelming to me. And so even though I was, you know, getting my finances under better control and holding a job and working with my partner, I was doing a lot of the right things. I wasn't able to really enjoy it because I was so so caught up in the anxiety from my trauma I, I i i mean i would spin and spin and spin god forbid like a boss should say mary beth i want to talk to you later <laughs> you know hey, hey why don't we chat i could say very casual hey stop by the office later. i mean my mind is like i'm getting fired what did i do wrong it, it's just i was always waiting for my world to explode i i didn't have any faith that things were going to stay good because i didn't yeah. i did i never experienced it it all felt temporary for me that I always, it was always, I was always worried one little mistake and they're not going to like put that mistake in perspective, right? They're going to, I'm going to be judged harshly. It's going to blow up in my face. Everything is going to go wrong. So it was in a constant state of stress, even though I was sober. So it wasn't, it was no way to live in the long run. I would never going to be able to be happy and really enjoy my life the way I, I deserved until I got that trauma, um, those trauma symptoms under control. I, I can, I can be like that actually on any given day, even today. Like sometimes I feel like, do you know, my life is so much better now in recovery, do you know, to be able to do this podcast as my job and to be married and have a car and have a home. And well, I have a kind of recurrent fear that would come over me where it's like uh, somebody's going to cancel us or somebody's going to, you know, it's going to be whipped from under us in the morning or what if the funding stops or what if people stop listening or, do you know, it's like, it's like things, were, things are so good now in relation to how bad they were. It's like you're nearly afraid to believe it, you know, but actually you have to kind of come to terms with, no, we actually deserve this and we're, and we're allowed to have these nice things in our life when life isn't all, all about suffering and misery, you know, and like there's no day in addiction a good day, but a bad day in recovery is way better than any any day in addiction, you know, because we can manage it, you know. Um, but I want to change direction a little because education is a big part of your story and it's a big part of mine and Timmy's story as well. So it sounds like, um, I know from listening to your story previously that you were doing well in school, even though you were using drugs when you were always bright, you had a natural flair for academia and stuff like that. And you went into college in your early years. It didn't quite work out for you, but you went back then as a mature student in your early 30s. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, so I went to college, well, right, out of, uh, right after high school, except a year delayed because I got arrested. That's a that's another story. But anyway, I went to college a year after I graduated from high school because of my arrest. Um, and I and that was straight through. And I was doing pre, I did well. I mean, academically, I did well. I went to Berkeley, we you know, which is a really top tier school. But, very famous, very yeah, famous school. Very isn't famous, it? yes. But um, but as I said, I started doing meth again in January of my senior year. And so I actually went to law school, Berkeley Law, in the fall, September. But I I, I was so strung out by the time I got there that. I I had to withdraw. Like I knew I was going to fail. I knew I was, and I knew I lost it because of my addiction. So I withdrew and that was just this sort of 
agonizing pain, you know, during the last 10 years of my using that I had, I mean, people would kill for that slot and I gave it back because of my meth addiction. And, um, and so when I got sober, uh, well, first of all, I, as I said, I worked my way down the corporate ladder. So I had to work back up. And, and my first job when I got sober was like a part-time low level temporary admin job, because that's all I was really ready for. Um, and then I got a permanent, you know, full-time job and then a supervisor job. And then when I had six years sober, I went to law school for real, you know, um, and I did end up graduating from Berkeley Law. And so that was like a real, um, it was a real joy of recovery to be able to get something back that I had something so important to me, something that I had really intended to do since, you know, I was young, I wanted to be a lawyer and to get that back in my recovery was a real, a real moment of joy for me. Um, and then I worked as a lawyer for a while and then a judge. How did you no, this is this is important because something like this happened to me as well. I, I I went into education at the age of thirty two and went through the different routes and I, I ended up doing a degree in something that I enjoy doing, which was construction. And because of COVID, um the graduation ceremonies were all cancelled. Oh. Yeah. So it never happened. But tell me this, how did you actually feel standing at that podium at the age of what, I don't know, was it 40, like just after graduating with a law degree, how did that feel? Like in 10 years, 10 years previous to that, you were strung out. How did you actually feel? I, I, it was, and I'll say, I'd say, I mean, that was a proud day of the graduation, but the moment I remember really is when I got the acceptance in the mail, you know, that was just, um, just the moment of pure joy that I actually had managed to get it back. You know, um, it was just such a, it, it felt sort of like I had come full circle that I was coming, that, that it was part of returning to who I had originally been part of returning yeah. to my true self. Right. Um, because in my substance use, I had lost that connection. When I got sober, I was cleaning out my file cabinet one day and I came across my college transcripts and I was afraid to open them because I thought maybe I misremembered. Maybe I thought I did better than I really did. Maybe my, because I had so lost my connection to that part of myself that had done well in school, that had been successful. Um, and, and finally, I did open them and it was like, okay, sure, yeah, okay, <laughs> it's what I remember. But if getting accepted back into law school, something I had given up because of my meth use disorder, just felt like it was a, uh, a symbol of coming full circle back to my original self, back to the self I would have been sure. It was 16 years later <laughs> when I started, but at least I was coming back to what I had always wanted to be. Yeah, you reminded oh. me there. You reminded me there. Um... Because I, I, I thought back of when I got accepted to go to college and even before I went to university, I went to a community college for a year. Even like, I remember um, getting the letter in to say you were on the course, you know, not that feeling of like, oh my God, yeah. things is working out. And then doing that course and then getting the acceptance letter to say, I remember when I was even applying for the university college, Cork here in our home city, like I didn't even have the money to, for the application. I had to go to... The Cork Alliance Centre, which is a charity that supports people like us, and uh, Sheila paid for the application and helped me with it. And then when I got accepted, it was like you know, it was the best thing ever, you know. And then along the way, you get little wins, you know. As you build up your experience, you get a job, you get an interview, and then you get the job. And it's like I think that gratitude for life and those little wins along the way kind of sustain you, don't they? Because like a lot for a lot of people, for me anyway, when you're a student like that, like. Times are tough financially, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, like full time education is great, but it's you're not going to have a lot of you know disposable income, you know. But it's just getting those little wins along the way really sustain you. Well, the other thing I'll say is that when I graduated from um, Berkeley Law, I went to work at a really big law firm, like you know the t- best job basically that you can get. Um, and that to me was, I felt like, like, you know, I got sober at 32. I felt like I was old. And by the time I graduated from law school, I was 42. I felt like I had lost all this time. And so having that job felt sort of like a way to try to catch up, you know, oh, now I've got this prestigious job and I'm making, you know, good money. Um, but after three and a half years and going on four years, it was really, the hours were crazy. I mean, I was working most weekends and holidays and I, my, we would have theater tickets and I could I could hardly ever go. My husband started calling my girlfriend 
find his second wife because she was going to all the things that we bought tickets for. <laughs> and, and so at, at, at that point, I really started standing back. I remember my therapist said, you know, you've climbed the mountain now, but what do you want your mountain to look like? You know, and at some point I realized, yes, this was an accomplishment. I was proud. I felt like I was making up for lost time, but it really wasn't how I wanted to live my life. And so part of it is giving ourselves permission, you know, to sort of reevaluate where we are intermittently and make sure that what met our needs or fulfilled us in the beginning or at one point in time, is it still working for you, you know, now that it's two years later or three years later? And I, I grew up a, a blue collar girl. I mean, my family didn't have money. No one else in my immediate family had graduated from college. And so to turning back and saying, you know what, I don't want that big, prestigious, high paying job anymore. Um, it was a real emotional decision. Uh, it was hard, but at the same time, I just realized I, I didn't want to live my life like that anymore. And, and so I gave it back and I got a, a government lawyer job, which was challenging and less money, but it was um, better for work-life balance. And so I just say that as an example to your listeners that, you know, what meets your needs at one point may not meet your needs later. And it's, it's important to stay in touch with what you want and where you are and make your choices, uh, you know, adjust your choices as, as you change your mind or you change your feelings about it. Did you amass any criminal convictions through your drug use and did that hamper your ability to move on with your life? I did. So I was arrested uh, in August after co after high school. So I was supposed to go to college like um, literally a month later. And I was arrested for hypodermics and methamphetamine. And I grew up in a small town. And so they knew I didn't have a, a juvenile record. I mean, it probably would have been sealed, but, you know, it's a small town. You know, they would know. Um, and so I was treated really lightly. They reduced my charges down to disorderly person offense, which is like below a misdemeanor. I mean, it's really it's nothing. And when I got sentenced, the judge in my sentence sentencing said that if I didn't get arrested for three years, I could get my record expunged. And so that's what I did, like erased. You know, in America, it's called expunged. You get it erased. And um, so I, I got it expunged. And then when I was, you know, like applying for the bar, the California bar, let's say, they don't ask, you know, have you ever done drugs? They ask, have you done drugs in the last five years or illicit drugs? And, and by, the, by then, I had like 10 years sober. And when I became a judge, I had 20 years sober. And I think they only asked about seven or 10 years. Years. So I was always able to, you know, say no and be, I was able to be honest and say no at the same time. Yeah. Um, um, on the other hand, um, I did eventually tell my employer when I was a judge because I was got on the board of Lifering and I had to run it through ethics. And so that was the first time I told an employer. But I, I wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times about how um, being a white middle class woman helped me become a judge. Because in America, if you're a person of color, your odds of getting stopped when you're driving is are a lot higher. Your odds of getting searched if you're stopped are higher. If they find drugs, the chart you get charges a higher chance, and the charges are higher and the sentences are longer. There's a real racial disparity in the enforcement of drug laws in America. Um, and I wrote an op-ed about that because the last 10 years that I was using, I had drugs on me every day, and I was stopped for tickets or minor accidents a lot of times, and I was never searched. And so the you only know? arrest I ever had was that one when I was 18. You know, as a judge then, was it all criminal law? Was it all criminal, you know, when you had people in front of you um, and you could see that they're drug addicts and the reason that they're committing some of these crimes is because they're trying to get money to be able to soothe themselves and feed their drug habits and stuff. I suppose you had that extra bit of compassion for them because you knew where they were coming from too. Yeah, so I didn't do criminal cases, but I did do cases that involved um, disability and medical. And so I saw a lot of people that had substance use disorder and I saw a lot of people with trauma, you know, that they, that their behaviors were actually I, I knew they were a result of their trauma history, poor decision making, you know, along the lines. Um, and I had I had certain law I had to apply, which I did. But like you say, I understood where they were and I didn't I didn't make it, you know, unfair judgments about them. Oh, they use drugs. Therefore, they're a liar or, you know, the kind of things that sometimes judges do. I just got the information I needed to apply the law and I, and, you know, and I applied it the way I had to and, and I moved on. I didn't really beat them up about it. But part of the reason I came out as a judge is to really help people have a, you know, to help try to reduce that stigma and increase the understanding that, you know, substance use disorder can hit anyone. You know, when you see people in recovery, you, you know, you don't even know if they had that history, right? Because in recovery, we look like everybody else. But um, but I did feel that as a as a judge, sometimes I can get people to hear me a little bit better when I talk about multiple pathways 
ever about, you know, that, that we need to help people more than we do. I mean, in America, for example, there is, you can't always get access to treatment. It just doesn't exist for everybody. There's no free, you know, affordable treatment in a lot of communities. Um, and so I talk a lot about the need to, to help people you know, no matter where they are, no, don't judge them. This is a health issue. This is a medical issue. This is a mental health issue. Let's, um, I, I was just like her. Let's, let's find some compassion and try to help her. Uh, do, you know in, do you know in America, like in Ireland, there's a, we have free health care. No, there's a two-tier health care system. So if you have private health care, you'll get better health care. But if you don't have insurance, you'll still get health care. So you're not going to be left to rot. In America, if somebody is strung out, for example, myself, if I was strung out on heroin and here I can get methadone, can I get methadone for free in America or suboxone or stuff like that? Or if does it ha- is, is, is everything through private insurance? So methadone clinics are government, you know, through, well, they're, they're, they have a special license, right? Um, in fact, they just, in America, there's been a lot of uh, um, sort of bureaucratic rules around methadone, uh, which were just recently eased a little bit. So I don't think people have to pay for their methadone, but it's hard to get. Uh, only about 10% of the people in America that could use medication-assisted treatment, whether it's methadone or buprenorphine or even suboxone for alcohol use disorder, only about 10% of people get access to it. And so access is, is part of the problem. And certainly if you want to go inpatient treatment, a lot of people don't have access to that because not everyone has medical coverage. And even if they do, it doesn't always cover it. Plus in America, if the, even if you have insurance, you're lucky if you get 30 days inpatient treatment, like that's the end of it and they'll, they'll push you out. So yeah, I, um, I heard before that the whole, the whole concept of 28 days treatment center actually comes from the American insurance companies, isn't it? Well, when I talk to like to, when I give presentations about substance use disorder, I tell them it's not 28 days because the data shows that's the optimal <laughs> length of time for treatment. It's 28 days because if you're lucky enough to have insurance, that's what it pays for, you know. So, yeah. I, I mean, the data shows that if you have support for 12 to 18 months, you know, that's what you really need to give your best thoughts. It doesn't have to all be inpatient, but you know, maybe outpatient or uh, sober living or uh, having access to a mental uh, therapist with substance use specialty or whatever it might be, 12 to 18 months of, of, of focused support is really what's going to um, give people their best chance. What's your opinion on the liberal drug laws across America at the moment with regards to marijuana? I mean, I believe in decriminalization of all drugs for personal use. I um, I think there's a number of problems with decriminalization, including the racial disparity. But also, for, in America, the government, the federal government, literally defines substance use disorder as a disease, and yet they criminalize it. Like to me, that's an inherent contradiction, right? You're criminalizing yeah. a disease, but that that doesn't make any sense. And even if the person doesn't have a disease, because most people who use substances don't, or just you know, why do I care if they're using it? not hurting anyone else and there's just a lot of problems a criminal record first of all you it's more expensive to put people in jail right three to four times the cost to jail someone as to treat them so that's not a good use of my tax dollars um but also there's a lot of ramifications on their future ability to get employment to get housing to get federal benefits to get education there's a a very disruptive effect of criminalizing something so i I don't believe in it at all yeah do you know, when you think about, do you know, in your in your experience, um, if you were unlucky enough to get arrested a couple of times and you had a conviction, like your life trajectory would have been so much different, and God only knows where you would have ended up. If if even that first time, if I would have gone to jail that first time and not been able to go to college, I don't think I would have ever gotten back there, or at least not until maybe in my 30s when I finally got sober. It would have completely derailed me. It really would have completely derailed me, and I and I and I'm aware of that. And I. I just, I, I also don't don't think that it's helpful in general. I mean, I, a lot, people get out of jail, right? And then they keep, there's no, usually there's no care after. They're not giving medication assisted treatment or they're not giving any kind of help. We just sort of throw them back out and say, good luck. And then we act surprised when, when they mm-hmm. pick up substances again and, and, and end up back in jail. So it's this vicious cycle that gets created that we don't even disrupt once we get them in the system. So for a multitude of reasons, I have a problem with it. Do you know when you do you know when you exposed yourself in the LA Times and other kind of um, opinion pieces you did for various newspapers? What kind of feedback did you get? 
Yeah, my first big public disclosure was in the Wall Street Journal where I wrote an op-ed and it was called, I Beat Addiction Without God. And oh, people were not happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the people were upset that an atheist had been allowed to be a judge as if this is relevant at all, right? I mean, not relevant, um, but, but then a lot of people didn't like me suggesting that there was any option other than 12 steps. Now, I don't mean it to say, it's not like no one supported me, but, the people, you get pushback. I also wrote an op-ed for the Philadelphia Inquirer in support of a safe injection site. And, you know, I understand that people, not everyone agrees with that. It's not, it's not that I had concern about them wanting to debate the topic. It's that, you know, when it's online, uh, even if it's in a reputable newspaper, a lot of it gets personal and, and mean rather mm. than having like, let's talk about the pros and cons of this policy, you know? So, but yeah, I got, I got pushback, but I was expecting it. So it didn't emotionally bother me for, except maybe the first 24 hours <laughs> yeah um, what's life like now since you're retired you know i'm busy because i i um i do a lot of advocacy work so i have my book came out in january but i'm on the board for life ring secular recovery i'm on the board for she recovers foundation which is not just substance recovery but also trauma recovery and mental health and everything else because it goes together so often um i write opinion pieces to you know in a variety of publications and i speak at radio, television, conferences, podcasts. I, I speak to a lot of different groups. I talk to a lot of friends and family, and I do do training of lawyers and judges um, about substance use and treatment and recovery options, multiple pathways. So I, I am retired, and um, but I'm pretty busy. <laughs> what, can people, what can people find in your book and if, if they want to look into it. Yeah, so it's available on Amazon and all the usual sites. And I'll say, I thought a lot about, before I wrote it, you know, did I have something new to add, you know, to the conversation? And I felt like a lot of memoirs, they sort of start in the crazy stories of addiction. And I show my childhood and what led up to it. You know, what? why did it make sense for me to pick up alcohol at 12 and shoot meth at 17? And then I do have my years of using, but 30% of my book is about recovery. And it's about basically the first three years of my recovery about how I built a plan, an individual plan that worked for me, but also that trauma recovery interplay with my substance recovery. And then at the end, I have like checklists and guidelines ideas for people to think about. So um, I really tried to make the book be be useful. Yeah, we, we, we linked the book in the description of this podcast, but would you believe you're not the first American judge we've had on our podcast? No, who else? <laughs> we had uh, Judge Judge Wren from Broward County in Florida. He set up the first mental health court in the United States. Ah, good. Uh, good for him, yeah. <laughs> no. But listen, when you're coming off to Ireland, be sure to give us a buzz and we'd love to get a coffee with you while you're over. Okay, perfect. I will do that. Uh, and thanks for your time. And... Uh, yeah, listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Congratulations on all your achievements. And you're a great advocate for people like myself and Timmy and some of our followers. So thank you and best of luck with everything going forward. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Thanks for having me.